love that every day we get to come onto this campus, which is gorgeous and just like such a reminder of the beauty of the church. And so thank you for this beautiful space. Um, I want to give a huge shout out to all of the helpers in the core team. Is there anyone that can stand up who helped set up at all tonight or any other of the love and responsibilities? Can I, can I have you stand up? Thank you. and Ryan at the bar for being the best bartenders ever. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to Father Charles from France. Where's, where's Father Charles? Thanks for flying me in all the way from France or Rome or wherever you live. I'm not sure. I know you're French, but you might live somewhere else. Um, so actually, really cool shout out. Father Charles is a friend of the Culture Project. He um, runs the Emmanuel School of Missions and they're doing really cool things. It's a school in Rome where you can like devote your entire year to just serving um, as a missionary, but they're launching something up in New York City. So if you have any interest in like serious, hardcore missionary work, first look at the Culture Project and then look at Father Charles. Um, Really, no, he, he's doing great work, so talk to him and make sure you find him at the bar after. Um, and um, also, I wanted to give a shout out. April 9th is, again, second Sunday for the, um, the Culture Project. Every second Sunday of the month, we uh, head over after the Archbishop's Mass. We head out um, to uh, the city tap, and um, we get drinks. But before that... Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to the Cathedral Young Adult Group, who is going to be uh, celebrating at, just life at the Cherry Blossom um, Festival, and then heading to the Archbishop's Mass, and then after we're joining the Culture Project for the second Sunday. So this is just like such a great testament to how many great things are going on in um, in Philadelphia for our young adults. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Even more of a reason to go get a drink. Um, and last but not least, I wanted to thank you guys. Um, you're what make this night and this community. So thank you for showing up and for your energy and your zeal um, for coming back uh, time and time again. Can I have a raise of hands? Who has made it to every single night? Wow. Who, whose first time is tonight? Wow! Awesome. Well, whether you're old or you're new, you are welcome here and you are part of the Culture Project because you're here. So thank you so much for showing up and um, making it out. This is the fifth, fifth night. And while some people thought this was the last evening, next week is actually the last evening. Um, we have Christopher West as kind of the culmination of all of our love and responsibility events. Christopher West will be speaking and um, invite all of your friends. Um, we're going to talk about it again at the very end. Um, and uh, it's going to be a big, a big deal. And um, the, the topic of tonight is chapter 9 and 10. For those of you who are new, we're reading um, a book that is a breakdown of St. John Paul II's love and responsibility. Edward Shree um, is the author of the, of the book that we're reading. You can get the book, I think still, we have some copies, you can buy it for $15, which is kind of a suggested donation. This is an exploration of men and women and people and God's design of our relationship, and it's just such a powerful and profound thing that we've been exploring. So tonight, we're, um, we're going to be reading Excerpts, I just want to clarify that when we read things off of the screen, those are like excerpts and sentences and breakdowns of the chapters. We would encourage you to actually read the book because it's pretty cool. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna go through that tonight, and our guest speaker, um, who I'll introduce after our first readers, will be talking about chapter nine and ten, which is to inspire love, a return to modesty, and chapter ten, men, women, and tenderness. So without further ado, I'm going to call up our very first reader, and we're going to get the night started. Thanks. Chapter 9, To 
inspire love, a return to modesty. Does it really matter what kind of clothing a woman chooses to wear? John Paul II begins his treatment on modesty with an explanation of a common human experience, shame. Shame involves a tendency to conceal something, not just bad things such as sins, weaknesses, and embarrassing moments, but also good things that we want to keep from coming out in the open. Someone who performs a good deed may prefer that his action go unnoticed, for example. He may feel embarrassed if he receives a public compliment, not because he did something bad, but because he doesn't want to draw attention to his deed. Similarly, a student who receives high marks on an exam may feel embarrassed when the teacher praises her in front of the class because she wanted to share her good grade only with her closest friends and family. There are many good things that we wish to keep hidden from public eyes, and we feel shame if they are brought out into the open. This helps us understand one of the most powerful experiences of shame, sexual, sexual shame. Why do human persons tend to conceal body parts associated with sexuality? Why do men and women instinctively cover themselves quickly if someone of the opposite sex accidentally walks in on them while they are changing their clothes? John Paul II explains that this tendency to conceal those parts of the body that make it male or female is itself not the essence of shame. Rather, it is a manifestation of a deeper tendency to conceal the sexual values themselves, particularly insofar as they constitute in the mind of a particular person a potential object of enjoyment for persons of the other sex. For example, a woman may instinctively sense that if certain parts of her body are exposed, a man might view her merely for her sexual values as an object of pleasure. And those particular parts of her body reveal her sexual values so powerfully that indeed a man can be drawn primarily to those sexual values and not to her value as a person. That is why we tend to veil the sexual values connected with particular parts of the body, not because they are bad, but because they can overshadow the greater value of the person. John Paul II says sexual shame is a natural form of self-defense for the person. It helps prevent the person from being treated as an object of enjoyment. Thus, the concealing of sexual values through modesty of dress is meant to provide the arena in which something much more than a sensual reaction might take place. Modesty of dress helps protect interactions between the sexes from falling into utilitarianism and thus creates the possibility for authentic love to develop. Shame absorbed by love. Yet within the context of betrothed love, a mature self-giving love of a husband and wife, there is no longer any reason for shame. True love makes certain that sentimental and sensual experiences are imbued with affirmation of the value of the person to such an extent that it is impossible for the will to regard the other person as an object for use. Each person has confidence in the other's selfless love. They each have trust that they won't be treated merely as an object for the other's, other person's pleasure. Hence, their emotional and sensual enjoyment is grounded in full self-giving love and a profound sense of responsibility for the other person. The need for shame has been absorbed by mature love for a person. It is no longer necessary for a lover to conceal from the beloved or from himself a disposition to enjoy, since this has been absorbed by true love ruled by the will. Affirmation of the value of the person so thoroughly permeates all the sensual and emotional reactions connected with the sexual values that the will is not threatened by a utilitarian outlook. This kind of trust, however, can only be found fully in betrothed love. Only, only in a healthy, thriving marriage is shame absorbed by love in this way. That's why we want to dress modestly when we are with a member of the opposite sex to whom we are not married. Outside the context of betrothed love, we must be careful with the unveiling of sexual values, or else we will set ourselves up to be used by the opposite sex. Three paths to modesty. Now we are prepared to explore the three aspects of sexual shame presented by John Paul II and consider how they relate to modesty. We have already touched on the first aspect, that shame tends to conceal sexual values so they don't produce merely a sexual reaction in another person. A woman should want to avoid dressing in a way that deliberately draws attention to her sexual values to such an extent that it obscures her value as a person. 
Nevertheless, some women may object. If a man struggles with lustful thoughts, that's his problem, not mine. Why do I need to dress modestly? But this objection misses John Paul II's point. Remember, the purpose of modesty is not merely to help prevent men from stumbling into impure thoughts. Modesty of dress is primarily meant to protect the woman herself. John Paul II offers two important insights that help make sense of this. First, we must remember that human beings are fallen. It is not easy for us to avoid a utilitarian attitude when we see the body of the opposite sex. Simply saying, I shouldn't have to worry about how I dress, naively falls, fails to take this effect of original sin seriously. As John Paul II notes, man, alas, is not such a perfect being that the sight of the body of another person, especially a person of the other sex, can arouse in him merely a disinterested liking which develops into an innocent affection. In practice, it also arouses concupiscence, or a wish to enjoy concentrated on sexual values with no regard for the value of the person. He further explains that, as a result of original sin, a man too easily accepts the sensual reaction and reduces another person, because of the person's body and sex, to the role of an object for enjoyment. When this happens, John Paul II calls it depersonalization by sexualization. Modesty of dress, therefore, is in the woman's best interest. It helps protect her from being treated by fallen men as an object for exploitation. Second. John Paul II also reminds us that men struggle with sensuality in a way that is difficult for women to understand, since sensuality is more powerful in a man than it is in a woman. Because of this, women have an even greater need to conceal from men the sexual values of their body. This is difficult for women to appreciate since they don't experience sensuality in this way. Concealing our reactions. The second aspect of sexual shame is its tendency to conceal our own utilitarian reactions to the opposite sex when we treat them as objects for our enjoyment. We realize that a human person is not an object for use, and we feel ashamed if we treat people that way in our glances, thoughts, or imagination. Deep down, a man senses, I must not touch her, not even with a deeply hidden wish to enjoy her, for she cannot be an object for use. Consider what often happens when a man is staring at a woman lustfully and she notices it. As soon as he is caught, he quickly turns his eyes away because he feels ashamed of what he was doing. He does not want his utilitarian attitude toward her to be exposed. Deep down, he knows that she should, he shouldn't treat a woman that way and that the woman feels uncomfortable with his utilitarian looks, so he immediately looks away. Inspiring Love the third and most important aspect of sexual shame is its connection with love. Ultimately, modesty seeks to inspire love, true love for the person, not just a sexual reaction to a woman's body. Deep in a woman's heart is a longing to inspire and experience love. Thus, a woman should dress in a way that inspires love for her as a person. Dressing immodestly, however, hinders the possibilities for true love to develop, for it draws attention to her sexual values to such an extent that it overshadows her value as a person. Thank you. Thank you, Chris and Emma, for such excellent readings. Um, I want to um, introduce the speaker of tonight, who, after us reflecting on just excerpts from chapter 9 and 10, will kind of give um, kind of a... Um, kind of envelop the, the chapters with her own um, stories and with her own reflections. So um, the speaker of tonight is um, a very dear friend and also um, boss and uh, excellent leader to the Culture Project. She is probably one of the most incredible women that I know. Um, Christina Barba grew up in the area. Um, she went to Archbishop Carroll High School and then went on to study at Penn State. Do I have representatives from either of those schools? Just a few, okay. All right, don't be shy. Um, Christina Barba has spent her entire life in the pro-life movement and has been involved in the area 
Um, it is clear that God has um, just ordained her and blessed her with a very special mission in um, trying to um, promote the human dignity of every single person and inspire young people to do um, to do what it is that uh, we all ought to do, which is stand up for the human person, um, which has kind of led and developed um, her entire life and her entire um, involvement in the pro-life movement movement to um, to found and to start the Culture Project. The Culture Project is um, almost three years old, and um, I myself am a part of the Culture Project, and many of us are as well, and um, just by you being here tonight, you are partaking in the mission of the Culture Project, which is to um, to inspire and to call young people to live a life of virtue, and uh, starting with sexual integrity and understanding the dignity of, of ourselves and those around us. And um, it's incredible the mission and, and what has launched through um, the vision and um, just like the beautiful leadership of Christina Barba. So without further ado, I'm gonna welcome her up. Um, give her a, a warm welcome, Christina Barba. Okay, so I quite literally pay Stephanie to say nice things about me. Most of the time. Um, anyway, good evening, everyone. It is an honor and a joy to be here with you. How's the sound? Perfect. Perfect? Okay. Wow. Perfect. Um, it's an honor to get to present with you all this evening. The last few weeks have been quite a beautiful journey. And tonight we get to explore two topics that are quite beautiful and also could be quite sensitive. I had asked that we could break up the two chapters um, because they're interconnected, but I think they each just deserve um, a little bit of specific attention. I do want to say this morning I almost had no voice, um, so I'm doing pretty good, but um, I'm going to try to keep my remarks short so I don't lose the voice again. And that way you guys don't have to hear a horrible voice because that would not be fun. Um, anyway, so let's see, where do we begin here? Um, modesty. Okay, modesty. I've had an interesting relationship with modesty. A little bit of a love-hate relationship. I don't know if any of you women feel the same way. Um, naturally, I'm speaking from the feminine perspective, so my remarks would be tailored that way. But um, it's quite interesting because while modesty often is a topic that is pointed at the women, right? This is for you women. There's great truth to that. But guys, you don't get off the hook, okay? Uh, modesty is also important for men too, in a little bit of a different way. Um, and, I just, and I was actually reflecting today with one of my fabulous um, colleagues a little bit about this topic. And it's interesting because modesty, like in modesty of dress in, in a woman, we are, we're meant to protect something that's vulnerable, but it's also, it's about ourselves, but in turn for the other. And we, by modest dress, are attempting to safeguard not only our own dignity, but also those of the men around us. And it's a vulnerability and a weakness um, in, in a man, that orientedness towards sensuality, as we just read about. Um, so through modest dress, women, we are like kind of reverencing this, this area in a man that's like, like a little more vulnerable. Well, gentlemen, there's an area where we need you all to be modest too. So yeah, okay, like showing off like, you know, muscles, blah, blah, blah. Okay, yeah, there's a, there's a degree. But for women, generally, our vulnerable, our vulnerable place is a little bit more in our sentimentality, a little bit more in our emotions. So gentlemen, to like put this in a different perspective, to think about the way, I'm called modesty for you, to think a little bit more about your interactions with women in terms of like even flirtation and um, emotions and things like that. So I just wanted to start with that to think, you know, guys, you're not off the hook. Um, and some of the things that I'm saying to try to think in your perspective a, a little bit about that. So like a, a modesty in terms of how you approach the vulnerable part of a woman's heart and um, for, for women to think about the way that we um, protect the vulnerability of a man. So um, I think it's just kind of good to think about that. Um, so modesty, like I said, I've had a love-hate relationship with this. I've gone through many different stages, uh, overly frumpy, long denim skirts to the ground and turtlenecks, 
to some, you know, tank tops and short shorts that needed to get taken out of uh, the wardrobe. Yeah, the way we dress really does matter. It says something about ourselves. Uh, it doesn't matter because our bodies are bad and we have something that we have to be ashamed of or hide, but our bodies are good and they're beautiful and the way we hold ourselves and carry ourselves and the way we dress says something about us. Um, it's very simple. Uh, a, a priest walks in the room with a collar. That says something about him. We know he's a priest. There's an expectation. Um, a fireman walks in the door and is uniform, you know, he's a firefighter, um, a nurse, a doctor, etc. The way we dress sends a message to others. Um, and this is true for everybody. The way we dress sends a message to others. Um, I also, at the beginning of my remarks, want to say none of us are perfect, and it's really humbling to speak on these topics because it's a daily struggle to really live these um, topics fully. It's a struggle for me every day to become more and more of a woman of virtue and to learn how to walk that fine line. And I make plenty of mistakes, so it's, uh, it's quite humbling to be here discussing these topics, but to uh, maybe share some of the things I'm learning and uh, we can help each other kind of on this journey. Um, and also, despite where any of us have been um, living any of these things out, the past is the past, today is a new day, there's a new moment, we can always choose how we want to move forward. We can make changes and choices, so it's never, ever too late to uh, reevaluate the wardrobe, the way you dress, the way you act, how you present yourselves. We can always make changes on those things. Um, so let's see, I'm a little scatterbrained, forgive me. <laughs> but um, with modesty, so I think one of the most beautiful things is modesty really safeguards chastity, and chastity really safeguards love. Um, I have a, it's a little bit of a silly story, but from back when I was in high school, I um, had a crush on and off on, um, on this one person, and um, we were totally in different groups, you know, totally different groups, and, um, but senior year, like all of a sudden, I don't know if this happened in any of your high schools, but kind of towards the end of senior year, everyone kind of like became more friendly. I don't know, the different groups got together and people were kind of like cross-pollinating a little bit. And so I was like kind of hanging out more to this one guy that I on and off had a crush on. And, um, and we started like talking more regularly. And I was like so excited. And I started going to some different parties. And I thought, oh, you know, maybe something will happen. And, well, I guess the big thing then was hooking up, um, which is not exactly the same definition of hooking up today, I don't think. Just basically kind of make it out, all right? So that's what I was thinking, at least. So anyway, that's what was the big thing, like, oh, who's hooking up with who this weekend? So, like, we were talking, and it seemed like something was happening, and then all of a sudden, like, he just, like, dropped off, like, kind of stopped talking to me, and I was, like, really disappointed, you know? Like, gosh, nothing happened? And um, I, I ran into him like a few weeks after graduation, later that summer, and I kind of said, hey, you know, we're hanging out a lot, like, stinks, nothing more happened. And he paused and said, well, Christina, that's because you're, you're different. Like, what, what else could I have done? I'm, I'm actually quite selfish, and um, basically I, I would have just used you, and um, well, you're not that kind of girl, and I couldn't, I couldn't do that to you, you're, you're different than the rest. Um, and for like a second, I was like annoyed, and then I was like, oh, that's so sweet. Um, <laughs> I was like, I'm just a normal girl, I wanted you to kiss me. But, but, um, what was beautiful is I was a little bit more naive and innocent about that interaction, and he wasn't. And he was maybe a little more honest, actually. And I hadn't realized that I, through modesty, I was, projecting a certain image, and I, uh, I carried myself a certain way. And it wasn't even all that intentional at that point in my life, okay? So, but I was putting out a certain image and a certain vibe, like that, hello, I see myself with dignity and respect, and I want you to see me and I want to see you. So automatically, he realized, he didn't put me in that category of, of just an object or just someone to win. And now, I mean, I'm so grateful that I wasn't just another girl he kissed. Um, it was, it's just really interesting. So I really see that like silly example of how like a modesty in, in our dress and our way of life can really like safeguard 
us and it's safeguarding me in perhaps a weak moment in my chastity. So I'm like real grateful for that. Um, and again, it's not too late. You know, I think a lot of other um, young women in my, even in my high school, probably didn't even realize, the same way I didn't realize, that they were giving off different signals as well. So by immodest stress, that they were kind of sending a signal like, hey, I'm available. Um, often, women don't exactly know, well, we're different, so we don't exactly know the way that we're seen um, by a man. And I, often we do want attention, because I mean, I want attention. I mean, what woman does not want attention and does not want to be seen as beautiful? I, I want attention and I want to be seen as beautiful. But I want good attention and I want to be seen as a whole person. So I think uh, modesty really is an opportunity um, as a woman, not to hide, not at all to hide, but to actually be truly seen, seen as a whole person. Um, it, it gives us, it's not about being hidden, but it's actually about demanding um, an appropriate, like, onlook. It's about being viewed appropriately by the other. And your presence can be so incredibly powerful. Modesty is not, a, you know, again, about the potato sack and covering every inch of your, your body. Um, I think it's a real trick. It's tough, and I'm still back and forth struggling, battling with this topic every day. Um, we, not, we should not be ashamed of, of our bodies or um, looking feminine. So it's like this trick, this art, to dressing in a way that highlights our feminine beauty but doesn't draw so much attention just to certain aspects of our body that we can be seen um, as something to be used. So it's, it's tough, but it's, it's kind of doable, I think, to walk the line. Um, I remember at one point, so when I was coming out of my uber frumpy phase, uh, yeah, uh, actually, yeah, I, I was doing that mission school um, that Father Charles is here about, and I thought to be a missionary, like, I had super long hair, I chopped my hair, did locks of love, thought I was so good, donated my hair, had super short hair, didn't bring any makeup with me, uh, didn't bring a curling iron, and only had really, really frumpy clothes. And, um, and I thought like to be a missionary and that, that kind of simplicity. But actually that year, it was a, I, we traveled around Europe, I actually encountered very, very beautiful, particularly Italian and French women, that were like, had multiple kids, they looked fabulous, they were always well done, and they were out on mission, and I just thought, whoa, I think that's more like what it means to be a, a woman. Um, and it's this integration, so it's all about learning how to, to integrate these different things. I'm not saying you have to wear, like, you even have to wear makeup, or you have to wear tons of makeup, but it's okay to enhance our natural feminine beauty. Um, but anyways, that was an interesting kind of lesson to kind of go through. Um, but so when I was kind of coming out of this phase and trying to figure out this balance, um, I remember speaking to a couple of sisters, um, Sisters of Life actually, at a conference we were both at, and we were manning booths, and I was like, sort of wrestling with some of these chastity and modesty issues. And I thought, could I kind of get your perspective? And, um, and I was saying, because I came to this point realizing that I think, um, so as a single like lay woman that like does desire to get married, there's a difference in what's appropriate and modest dress versus um, a woman who's consecrated, right? A religious woman. So I kind of had all these theories in my head, but I needed to talk them out. And these sisters were so helpful. They were just so clear. They they talked about you know there's obviously certain standards of modesty for all women, but if you are open to marriage and a position to marry, you should look that way. You shouldn't look like you're a nun or you're consecrated. <laughs> I was like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> Maybe that's why I didn't get asked out on dates for some years there. I don't know. <laughs> Guess I was sending the wrong message. Um, but that was kind of like an aha moment, but it's like so duh. It's so common sense, actually, a lot of this stuff, but we miss it. I missed it at least. Um, and then on the contrary, if you're a consecrated woman, you shouldn't look like you're, you know, available to get married and you're looking for someone. So there's like this interesting kind of balance and dance that we all have to kind of, um, kind of do. Um, so back to what we went through in the book, the purposes of modesty, right? First is respect for one's own self and dignity, veiling what is sacred, then um, respect for others, particularly for, for women looking at men. Um, 
respecting their like oh, their certain weaknesses and certain points. Um, and then I think there's like this third aspect um, that actually uh, another friend reminded me of today, that actually modesty is something that as a woman, something that is a, a joy to do, that actually safeguards all women, like the mystery of every woman. Every time a woman is modest, she is unveiling part of my mystery, part of my beauty. And I think this is something that's been lost in our, in our world today. There's now like a boredom with, with the body. I mean, just walking through the mall, like the giant Victoria's Secret um, images and all those kind of things. Like people aren't even, like they don't even have a response to them anymore. And that's kind of sad. That's kind of sad. And some of my beauty and mystery has been revealed that way too. Um, and I just think it's interesting to think of that. It's about knowing your own value and worth as a woman and being seen that way, but also looking out for all other women and safeguarding our mystery. And maybe some of those women don't realize it yet, but by you choosing to be modest, you are actually honoring every other woman, every other woman out there. And you are honoring their mystery and their beauty. So we have a long ways to go, but I think it's really, really, really worth it to keep fighting for modesty. Um, let's see what else I was gonna say here. Okay. Um, so one last kind of point. Um, so I, I really think the clothes we choose to wear matter as a part of modesty, but also there's a self-possession that comes, I think, with modesty. And even if you walk out of the house with, like, say, a new skirt that you bought, a lot of women will understand, and it looked fine when you were standing, but you didn't wear it too long, and then you go to sit this and that, and you're like, oh, no, this is too short. Oh, boy. Um, instead of having a panic about that, there's nothing you can do now. You are out, and you are stuck in that skirt, okay? <laughs> Just be aware of the skirt the rest of the day and how you choose to sit and stand and walk, and own it. Okay? Just own it. Rock it. Be confident. Because if you're not confident, then you're going to be doing them, you know, back and forth all day, and the, it's oh, just a mess. So, have a sense of your inner dignity, and remember that actually the way you carry yourselves really matters most, in, in a way. Um, so yeah, that's uh, just a point I wanted to make. And then um, there are two women saints that I just kind of wanted to throw out there that um, I love and help me in this area. Um, St. Catherine of Siena and St. Joan of Arc. Um, St. Joan of Arc was a young French woman that went to battle, I mean, crazy story, but there was like this debate, um, God called her out of her little country town to like go lead the army and yeah, craziness, but anyway, there was a debate as to what she should wear when in battle, and um, I found this very interesting, that the appropriate thing for her to do was to wear the right thing for the task and the duty she was doing. And it was, it was not sensible for her to be in a long flowy skirt or a super feminine dress. She actually dressed like a soldier. And um, I think there's something to that for us to have in mind, that there's a practicalness to modesty, a reality, that you need to dress appropriately for also the functions that you're, you're doing. Um, and she was so feminine that she could be in a soldier's, whatever it's called, suit, costume, I don't know, my brain's not working. <laughs> Whatever soldiers wear. <laughs> thank you. And in the armor, thank you. And she still had a feminine charm and charisma that won over the hearts of all of the men. And she's still soft in their hearts. So I think that's just one, one example. And then just another of St. Catherine of Siena. It was said that in her presence, men instantly felt like more more of themselves. They felt more like men. She had some kind of a feminine presence that allowed men to be more free and to be more like themselves. And I think there's something to that in modesty. There's a practicality, there's, a, there's a, an ownership that, that we have, and this is a call for, for women to know and master your own dignity, to be confident to wear the appropriate thing for the appropriate task or whatever, um, and that no matter what you're wearing, you have a power with your femininity to change others, particularly the men around us. So, those are my remarks for modesty. Um, 
we'll have time for a discussion and a Q&A later, but I'd love to invite up our readers for our next, se our next section. So, thank you. Men, women, and tenderness. Holding hands and an embrace, a kiss. These can be innocent expressions of love, but without great vigilance and virtue, these outward expressions can easily become a form of utilitarianism that actually ends up driving two people further apart and preventing love from fully developing. This is a point John Paul II makes when he addresses the topic of tenderness. He explains that the essence of tenderness is found in the tendency to make one's own the feelings and mentality the states of another. This is a common experience in romantic relationships, as men and women feel closely involved with the inner life of their beloved, entering into the other person's feelings and state of mind. Tenderness also seeks outward expression. It's not enough to have an awareness of what is going on inside the other person. One also wants to communicate that sense of closeness to his beloved. I feel the need to let the other, I, know that I take his feelings and his state of mind to heart. To make this other human being feel that I am sharing it all, that I am feeling what he feels. We thus express this tenderness through various outward actions. Holding a person to one's chest, putting one's arms around the other, kissing the other. Premature tenderness. Tenderness may be quite selfless and innocent when it is based on concern for another person and what that, that person is doing through interiorly. However, John Paul II warns that outward gestures such as an embrace or a kiss can lose, can lose their altruistic character and quickly fall into utilitarianism if they are used primar primarily as a means to one one's own pleasure. Thus the need to gratify one's own feelings begins to overshadow genuine selfless concern for the other. Expressions of tenderness have crossed over into egoism and will prevent love from fully developing. And crossing that line into egoism is something we can easily fall into for two reasons. First of all, as John Paul II reminds us, the love between men and women is driven in large part by sensuality and sentimentality, which are never fully satisfied and are constantly demanding ever greater amounts of pleasure. Given our fallen human nature, outward expressions of tenderness may be sought more for the emotional or sensual pleasure we receive than for a selfless desire to enter into the in inner life of the other person. Hence, various forms of tenderness can easily diverge from love of the person and stray to the direction of sensual or, at any rate, emotional egoism. Second, as we have seen, the subjective aspects of love, the powerful emotions or sensual pleasure we experience, develop more quickly than the objective aspects of virtue, such as friendship, self-giving, and responsibility. Since the emotion of love is for many people experienced as a sudden and powerful explosion, Many are tempted to give or receive outward expressions of tenderness before those objective aspects of love have had a chance to develop. Indeed, when we give or receive an embrace, a kiss, or some other expression of tenderness prematurely before the objective elements of love have matured, we are actually putting up roadblocks to love. Going too far? The experience of many young people bears this out. In the early stages of a relationship, a man and woman may begin to develop a good friendship. They may spend a lot of time going for walks, going out for coffee, socializing in larger groups of people, always in good conversation with each other, getting to know each other. But once the relationship becomes physical, those physical forms of intimacy increasingly become more central to the relationship. While real communication, working through problems, and growing in virtue together gradually slide. And that should not surprise us. Once we experience the powerful feelings associated with sensual pleasure prematurely, 
It's no wonder we are less likely to cultivate the objective aspects of love that require more work. Why go through all that effort when the sensual pleasures can be so easily and immediately obtained? In reality, however, the giving or receiving of premature tenderness creates only the appearance of love, and it often covers up the real underlying attitude driving a relationship, an egoism, a selfishness that is the very opposite of love. That's why we must be extremely careful in giving or receiving acts of tenderness. John Paul II says expressions of tenderness should always be accompanied by an even greater sense of responsibility for the other person. There can be no genuine tenderness without a perfected habit of continence, which has its origin in a will always ready to show loving kindness and so overcome the temptation merely to enjoy it put in its way by sensuality and carnal concupiscence. Without such continence, the natural energies of sensuality and the energies of sentiment drawn into their orbit will become merely the raw material of sensual or at best emotional egoism. The Tremors of Marriage After treating the dangers of premature tenderness, which applies especially to dating and courtship relationships, John Paul II goes on to discuss the crucial positive role tenderness must play in marriage. He discusses not just the outward manifestations of tenderness, but more fundamentally, tenderness itself. In marriage, tenderness should involve the steady participation of emotion, of a durable commitment to love, for it is this that brings a man and a woman close together, creates an interior climate of communicativeness. He then says that a great deal of this kind of tenderness is needed in a marriage. In this context, John Paul II offers, offers a second even fuller definition of tenderness, in light of how it applies to the spousal relationship. Tenderness is the ability to feel with and for the whole person, to feel even the most deeply hidden spiritual tremors, and always to have in mind the true good of that person. What a powerful description, to feel the most deeply hidden spiritual tremors. Do you feel what is going on most deeply in the soul of your spouse? her hopes, her, his fears, her burdens, his wounds. The Pope challenges spouses to have hearts that are truly united, truly able to enter into the inner lives of one another. He writes, tenderness creates a feeling of not being alone, a feeling that his or her whole life is equally the content of another and very dear person's life. This conviction very greatly facilitates and reinforces their sense of unity. Wives and tenderness. Finally, John Paul II says women not only expect this type of tenderness from their husbands, but that they actually have a special right to it in marriage. He gives several reasons for why husbands need to enter deeply into the emotional lives of their wives. First, at the most basic level, the woman's emotional life is generally deeper than a man's. The woman, therefore, has a greater need for tenderness. Even though men have a difficult time understanding this, since they don't share that need as much. Just as women may not fully grasp the power of sensuality in a man, and therefore struggle with modesty, so men may have a difficulty appreciating the depth of their wives' emotional sphere, and may fail to show them the tenderness they need. The Challenge to Husbands John Paul II challenges men to do more than provide for their wives financially, or take care of things around the house. He challenges husbands to enter deeply into their wives' emotional lives, to feel with and for the whole person. Men who get so caught up in work, sports, the nightly news, or projects at home, while remaining emotionally distant from their own wives, fail to provide the kind of tenderness he is describing, the kind of tenderness that women have a special right to in marriage. This challenge to men is especially important when their wives become mothers, for that is perhaps when women need the tenderness of their husbands most. Thank you. Okay, so another uh, challenging passage. Um, I see this chapter as kind of divided into two sections. One that speaks about premature tenderness and tenderness in the, more the dating courtship relationship, and then tenderness uh, within marriage. Um, so, I have to say, I just love how John Paul II talks about human love. He just under, seems to understand this in such a 
deep and, and beautiful way. His writings never get old to me on these topics. Um, and actually, if you're enjoying this book, if you haven't already um, delved into his actual book, Love and Responsibility, I highly recommend it. Um, also, another source that I love, um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, <laughs> Particularly on the, the topics of sexuality, I think that the Catechism actually does a beautiful job describing um, love and the call to chastity and um, the call of married love. Uh, surprisingly, it's not just like hardcore rules and regs, it actually fleshes things out a little bit. So I might quote this a little bit, we'll see how we go. But ooh, highly recommend, um, particularly the chapter on the Sixth Commandment, I think, is, is really excellent. Um, so, basically, I think um, when John Paul II is talking about tenderness and this uh, appropriate response between uh, man and woman, it's like a grown-up version of like a chastity talk, um, as I see it. Um, you know, chastity is really just the successful integration of our sexuality into who we are. I very simply like to think of chastity as living in reality. So basically sharing intimacy as it's appropriate to the reality of the situation. Um, and I think that's a little bit what John Paul II is talking about in this, this call to tenderness. Um, I find it particularly striking and challenging as he speaks about prematurely opening up tenderness um, between a male and a female in a, in a courtship or a dating relationship. And um, I think it's a, it's a super big challenge, but I think he's really right. And the fact that premature, uh, an experience of premature tenderness can really actually um, ruin one's opportunity to have a true loving relationship. Because once you enter into that realm that's a little more exciting and quick and fast paced, it's like hard to slow down to actually take the time to talk about how your day was or your hopes or your dreams. Um, that emotional drive, um, that sexual drive, naturally is so strong that it kind of eclipses everything else. And it's so easy to get wrapped up into all of that. Um, so I think something that's interesting, I was uh, had a meeting yesterday evening um, with uh, a big supporter of the Culture Project, and he told me this awesome quote, which I'm going to totally butcher. I don't remember who said it, but it's some coach, I think a basketball coach. Um, <laughs> but the essence of it, I'm gonna, I have to call him back and be like, hey, um, yeah, I need more details. But um, it's like some, yeah, I, some of you people might recognize this, but anyway, some really important coach um, was speaking about his team. I think it was basketball. And um, they were commenting on like the work ethic of the younger people and, you know, guys showing up late for practice. Recently, there's Brian Martin for South Carolina. I don't know. <laughs> well, let me, let me tell you a little more and then you can correct me here. So, but, but I guess he was being interviewed about like what's happening, like why, where's the work ethic, guys are showing up late, they think it's no big deal. And he says, well, they haven't changed. Like, the young people haven't changed, but we have. Those who are appropriately in authority have failed to provide proper structure. Something like this. I'll have to find out the proper quote. But I think that's really interesting, particularly in these topics. Humans are humans. We've been humans for as long as we've been humans. Um, we have particular uh, weaknesses and inclinations. And for a while, society used to kind of like build a framework of more support. And now it's quite difficult, especially for young adults in dating relationships. There isn't like the same construct that helps you to have like healthy balance um, and appropriate alone time and space and things like that. So I, I think it's um, an interesting thing that we need to take note of in today's world that those constructs are kind of missing and people are living away from home, and it's like really hard to, to know how to appropriately date and share intimacy. So we have that not going for us. So we have to try to find a way to kind of build that in. Um, and I, I really think, going back to old school, old fashioned things, 
It's, it's simply chastity. It's having an understanding of who we are, learning to master our own sexual desires, realizing that the end of a relationship is love, that's the goal, and willing the good of the other. I think uh, it's super easy to get swept up even in romantic love or the dream of romantic love. And we can so easily miss the point of what each of us are doing here on this earth. That we're, each and every one of us were made out of love for love and the image and likeness of God. And he has a unique plan for each of us. And that plan surely involves love and loving. Each and every one of us, no matter what our vocation, no matter what our call, we are all called to love. That is for sure. It doesn't matter what our sexual orientation is. It doesn't matter who we're attracted to. We are all called to love. And the only sure way to love is through chastity, is through a mastering of your own self and your own sexual desires. Chastity gives us this freedom to discern what kind of tenderness is appropriate at right moments of time. Chastity gives us a freedom to fall radically in love with anyone and for it to still be appropriate. Um, I think it's something that's kind of lost. We have this overly romantic view of love and I think we forget that friendship is very a very real thing, the friendship kind of love. But the end of love is actually heaven, not marriage. Um, you can be in a relationship with someone that is beautiful and you can grow in love for one another. And the correct thing might be to end the relationship and you were supposed to journey with someone for a period of time. But that love was never a waste. And if we let our love be rooted in this self-knowledge, if we let our love be rooted in chastity, we have nothing to be afraid of nothing to be ashamed of, and it allows our love to always be fruitful and to never, ever be a waste. I also think that um, like learning to master those sexual desires and, again, this, this understanding of tenderness, I think that's such a beautiful word and a beautiful expression, that learning how to put that tenderness in the appropriate space and place, it really gives that that freedom, um, it gives that space that you can encounter another person. It frees you to actually love. It frees you to see what it is that you're supposed to do in this day. I also think it's super important for each of us to remember that chastity is really hard. It's a difficult, difficult long-term matter. Um, it's not something that once is you, you know, you've mastered this and you acquire it. You don't acquire chastity and you're like, done. Um, I wish that was the case. This would be a lot easier. But it's something that you have to regularly work on. And I think the moment that any of us stop proactively living chastity, we're in big trouble. It's something that has to be a proactive thing that each of us do, that has to be on our mind. Because we don't have these societal constructs to help us from day to day. We have to actively be learning more about ourselves um, and others around us and, and what is appropriate. I mean, that's something we really have to be kind of on, on guard for because um, it's, super, it's not super hard and not easy. Um, and then, again, once you think you own it, you're in big trouble. Um, and then phases of life change. So there are different, at different times of life, you have to like learn how to guard the chastity in different ways. There'll be new challenges. Um, yeah, you just gotta keep struggling with it and have some good friends that can really support you and challenge you um, and speak honestly to you. It's uh, really, it really, really helps. Um, but I think it's such an old fashioned word. I mean, tonight we're talking about modesty and chastity. These are such old fashioned terms and concepts, but I really think they are what allow us to be free, to be ourselves, and to love, because at the end of the day, all each of us really wants to do is, is to love and to be loved. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what happened last night or this morning or 10 years ago, we always have an opportunity. We always have an opportunity to choose 
to, to live this life, to come closer to the Lord, to work on those bad habits, um, just as someone that's already on the path needs to be vigilant and actively on the path, anyone can get back on the path. Um, it's possible, and even though it's hard work, and at first it's harder work, it gets, does get a little bit easier. Um, St. Jose Maria Scriva says, um, oh gosh, I'm like forgetting this quote. I love it, it's one of my favorites. Oh, something about, I'm like, my brain is not working. Let's see if I have this. Um, well, I don't. But it's something about how chastity is a difficult matter. But once you, um, you struggle and strive for it, and you get to a place of self-mastery, it's, it's like a crown. Um, and it is something that once you get on that, like on the bandwagon, it becomes like a little simpler and easier, and you, you receive more freedom with it. Sorry, I butchered that, Jose Maria. Hopefully he'll forgive me. Um, this John Paul II quote, I've been basically saying this, but I want to give you his words. He says, chastity is a difficult long-term matter. One must wait patiently for it to bear fruit, for the happiness of loving kindness, which it must bring. But at the same time, chastity is the sure way to happiness. He also boldly says, that only the chaste man and the chaste woman are capable of true love. Darn. So that's a little bit intense. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's the way. So at least we know the path. Um, but I, I really think there's this opportunity that we have to look at, at this, especially this chapter on, on tenderness, to kind of re renew and reorient our hearts to some of the basics and learning more about ourselves and, and those around us, learning how to master our emotions, our sentimentality, the way we express ourselves, so that way we are totally free to love and encounter those around us and free to accept whatever mission God puts in front of us. How sad would it be if we had to say no to an incredible opportunity because we hadn't mastered something in ourselves? So let us together struggle to um, be chaste men and women. Let us together struggle to understand how to experience tenderness in the right way. Let's help each other. Giorgio, because he died a single lay man, very young, had his whole life ahead of him. But because he was a man of virtue and because he was chaste, he was free to love and he lived an incredibly full life in those few years he had. And none of his life was a waste. Um, and there is great fruit from his life. Um, and then obviously John Paul II, because he's the best, and he totally <laughs> seemed to get human love in a really deep way. So if I ever get married, I want him to do my marriage prep. Is that possible? I don't know. <laughs> All right, so that's enough for me. Um, I hope small group time is fruitful, and we'll reconvene later. Um, we're going to break into small group now, so um, if everyone could just kind of stay in their area, but turn to the six to eight to ten people in um, in their vicinity um, and find a small group leader.